Our uh, last uh, lecture for the morning, What's New in My Specialty, um, is uh, we've invited Dr. Patrick Olson, an orthopedic surgeon uh, at the Rosenberg Cooley Metcalf, Clin uh, Metcalf Clinic in Park City, Utah. Uh, Dr. Olson obtained a master's in public health and doctor of medicine degrees from the University of Utah School of Medicine, completed orthopedic residency at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire, and a master's in healthcare leadership at the Dartmouth Institute of Health Policy and Clinical Practice. While he was in New York, working on subspecialty fellowship in elbow, wrist, hand, and microsurgery at Columbia, he came across the research, research on the benefits of whole food plant-based diet and quickly made the transition to a plant-based lifestyle. Uh, he completed a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell. He was a co-founder of Plant-Based Utah. Uh, please uh, help me welcome Dr. Olson today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have to be with you all today. So um, if we have any orthopedic surgeons in the room, just raise a hand. Anyone here? Just want to make sure I'm not going to offend anyone with some of the things I say today. Um, so I'm going to talk about inflammation, nutrition, and the musculoskeletal system from an orthopedic surgeon's perspective. Um, no conflicts. I am a, a consultant for an orthopedic company called Nuclips um, with uh, some disradius stuff, but I'm not going to talk about implants, and I decline the honorarium for today, so I'm volunteering my time. Um, a little of my background, you heard, University of Utah residency at Dartmouth, master's at, at Dartmouth. I did a fellowship at Columbia in hand and microsurgery, and then I'm a partner at, at the, it's called the Orthopedic Partners now. It used to be called Rosa McCooley Metcalf Clinic. I'm the elbow, wrist, and hand surgeon of the group, and I also do a lot of general orthopedic trauma. We get a lot of uh, ski accidents, you can imagine, up in Park City. Um, so, first of all, when you think about orthopedic surgery, it's kind of classified in two main buckets. There's elective and there's non-elective orthopedic surgery. So with non-elective orthopedic surgery, it's all the general trauma stuff that we do, which is I do actually quite a bit of my practice is really trauma. So it's broken bones, cut tendons, ligaments, nerves, et cetera. Um, this is, I had to take care of this last evening. So a 31 year gentleman fell off a ladder. He had an open intraarticular distal uh, radius fracture, and you see that ulna just poke through the skin. And so wash it, at, clean it, fix it, and these patients do really, really quite well. So these are very satisfying, very, you know, cut and dry, needs, needs to get taken care of. And, and it's some of my favorite part of orthopedic surgery is dealing with difficult issues like this. Um, this is some other kind of a hodgepodge of things that I do. These are all um, recent surgeries, so hip fracture, nerve repair, tendon, ligament repair, scaphoid fracture, tibia fracture, et cetera. But then we have this whole world of what we call elective orthopedic surgery. So elective orthopedic surgery is not necessary. It's more kind of quality of life type surgeries that we do for pain. Um, hopefully improving function, but really mainly for pain. So what are some examples? It's things like spine fusion for low back pain, hip replacements for hip pain, knee replacements and knee revisions for knee pain, shoulder replacements for shoulder, same thing with the wrist. So et cetera, et cetera. When you look at orthopedic surgeries in general, like how much of orthopedic surgery we do is elective and how much is non-elective? Um, you can imagine that the main stuff that we do in orthopedics is actually elective, so it's not necessary. Um, the top three, total knee arthroplasty, total hip arthroplasty, and knee scopes, uh, and, can and compromise 55% of all the cases that we do in orthopedic surgery. So are these elective orthopedic surgeries effective? So let's look at that. So this came out of the British Medical Journal in 2001, just a couple of years ago, and they looked at the top 10 most common elective orthopedic uh, procedures, and specifically what they wanted to look at is level one evidence of, of our elective practices that we do. Um, things like total hip knee, three types of knee scopes, couple shoulder scopes, carpal tunnel release, and two types of low back surgery. And what they found is, is randomized control evidence, level one evidence, supports the superiority of carpal tunnel release, thank goodness, I do a lot of endoscopic carpal tunnel release, and total knee replacements over non-operative care. But there's really no good randomized control trials comparing total hip and meniscal repair with non-operative care. And then trial evidence of the other six procedures show no benefit over non-operative care. Ouch. Conclusions, although they may be effective overall or in certain subgroups, no strong, high-quality evidence base shows that many commonly performed elective orthopedic procedures are more effective than non-operative alternatives. That's kind of a harsh hit to, to us as a practice when mo most of what we do is this kind of uh, surgery. So is what we do placebo surgery? So the question is, do we have to do more placebo control trials? 
So a lot of, um, you know, we know the power of placebo. Is there power in placebo surgery? So there has been a few studies, not many, looking at placebo surgery. A really famous one that you all probably have heard. This came out in New England Journal of Medicine. This was back in 2002. Back at that time, they were doing these arthroscopic debridements of the knee for knee osteoarthritis, removing loose bodies, those kind of things for knee pain. And so one surgeon, Dr. Mosley, thought it'd be interesting to see, well, is it any better than just doing a placebo? Like, how is that, is it really effective? So what they did is they got 180 patients with knee osteoarthritis. They divided into three groups, randomized arthroscopic debridement, arthroscopic lavage, or a placebo. Patients in the placebo group actually received skin incisions, underwent a simulated debridement, but they didn't get the insertion of the scope in their knee. And then the patients and the assessors were both blinded to the treatment group. So the, the patients did not know if they had the actual surgery or not, and they had a two-year follow-up. So what did they find? At no point did either the intervention group report less pain or better function than the placebo group at two years. In this controlled trial involving patients with osteoarthritis of the knee, the outcomes after arthroscopic lavage or debridement were no better than those after placebo surgery. Interesting. So that kind of begs the question is how much of what we do in orthopedics is placebo? Um, so we have very limited placebo-controlled randomized control trials for many orthopedic surgeries. And the other thing that's important to note is we don't really know why a lot of things hurt. I know that's kind of, uh, you would think we would know that, but we really don't know. We don't know why osteoarthritis hurts. So this is a, an article came out in Current Osteoporosis uh, Reports in 2018. Uh, Dr. Felsen and his colleague, look, summarizing the research on this topic, said that there's relatively poor correlation between severity of osteoarthritis based on plain radiograph changes and symptoms. In other words, patients can be bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, no pain, Patients can have minimal joint space narrowing and be absolutely miserable. So we really don't know why it hurts. And if we don't know why it hurts, why are our surgeries making people feel better? That are very invasive surgeries with a whole host of complications. And it's also widely recognized that osteoarthritis is a disease of the whole joint. It's not just the cartilage. It's the subchondral bone. It's the synovium. It's everything else that's involved in the joint. So I think just a few definition terms real quick. So a lot of times when we think about arthritis, we kind of put it in these two main camps. Osteoarthritis is thought to be kind of more wear and tear, non-inflammatory. And then there's rheumatoid arthritis is thought to be inflammatory, autoimmune. But there's, it's much, much, much more nuanced. It's much more of an overlap. There's osteoarthritis that has a lot of inflammatory component. And, and so um, my partner, Dr. Rosenberg, who's since retired, he'd always call it low versus high CRPOA. So CRP, C-reactive protein, which you all know is a marker of systemic inflammation. And he found that when he did knee replacements on patients with high CRPOA, that they would have very kind of thickened synovium with these big, long, kind of big osteophytes and just really angry looking tissues, whereas those with low CRPOA had a very different milieu in their joint. So um, here's just a recent scope I did uh, on a wrist scope of a patient, a six, nine year old gentleman in severe wrist pain, not the best images, um, but he had a really thickened synovium inside of his wrist joint with significant arthritic changes, whereas this is the scope of the 25 year old gentleman that had to scope his wrist for some trauma issues, and he had very little syno uh, synovitis in his wrist. So I think the synovium, the lining in the joint, has a big part to play in the pain that patients experience. So what does synovitis have to do with joint pain? So this article in 2017, it's a review looking at synovitis of osteoarthritis. They found that, quote, the synovium may show significant changes with infiltration of mononuclear cells, thickening the synovial lining and production of inflammatory cytokines. There's a high prevalence of synovial inflammation of all stages of osteoarthritis. So when people say osteoarthritis is not inflammatory, it's not true. There's actually um, inflammation in all stages of osteoarthritis. And synovitis is related to pain, poor function, and maybe even an independent driver radiographic onset OA. Here's a kind of a, a, a picture they took from the, the article. So you can see a really thickened synovium, and there's a whole host of pro-inflammatory uh, mediators. Um, cytokines, MMPs, et cetera, that lead to not only joint pain, but cartilage destruction. So they said, quote, treating key aspects of the synovia inflammation therefore holds great promise for analgesia and also for structure modification. And I think really that is the key, is that we got to somehow tackle the synovitis within a joint and we can help with the pain and then avoid these huge surgeries that we're doing. So the question is, is there a better way to a big operation like this for knee pain? 
I think absolutely there's a better way. I think we're going to look back on this and think this is crazy. We'd take this saw, we'd cut the ends, the ends off of the femur and the tibia, we'd put this big metal implant on there to help with knee pain. I think someday we're going to look at it and think it's a little crazy. Um, so we don't know all the answers, but I do think there's definitely at least a role for lifestyle medicine in uh, uh, orthopedic surgery. So how do I know that? So there's actually some pretty good studies that support what I just said. This came out of American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2020, so a lot I'm going to share with you in the last five years. So the Osteoarthritis Initiative is a, an NIH study. It looked at over 5,000, about almost 5,000 individuals over an time, a, a eight-year time frame. And they kind of classified their diets into two main patterns. So there's the Western pattern, which is the SAD diet, the standard American diet. And that's a lot of meat, dairy, and processed foods. And they found that those that followed the Western pattern had increased radiographic and symptomatic arthritis progression over an eight-year time frame. Whereas those who followed a prudent pattern, eating a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, fish, whole grains, and legumes, had decreased radiographic and symptomatic disease progression. So how does diet affect joint pain? I really think this is the key. It has to do with the synovial inflammation that, that I've been talking about. So in my mind, and I'm going to share with you some more data to support this, the ideal diet for joint pain and inflammation is probably what you've heard a little bit already today and over the course of this conference. It's a whole food plant-based diet. It promotes the increased consumption of leafy greens, vegetables, fruits, legumes, beans, whole grains as the staple foods. So the center of your plate are these types of foods. It minimizes animal-based products, including dairy and eggs, and processed foods with added sugar, salt, and oil. So how does diet affect joint pain? So there's pro-inflammatory things that affect joint pain, mainly found in animal products and processed foods. It has to do with gut, your gut dysbiosis. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It has to do with this molecule, new 5GC that I'm going to talk about, that's found mainly in red meat and dairy products, and arachidonic acid. And there's also, on the flip side, there's the anti-inflammatory properties that are found in whole plant foods, specifically the phytonutrients, the carotenoids, the anti-inflammatory spices, and the big elephant in the room, fiber. Oh, we love fiber, and I'm going to talk about why that's so important with joint pain. So first, let's talk about gut dysbiosis. So this is an article that came out in 2020, so Dietary Habits, Nutrition, and Rheumatoid Arthritis. So what they found is that gut dysbiosis, as related to an unhealthy diet of a lot of uh, meat-heavy processed foods, leads to this synovitis they find in the joint, this autoimmune stuff that's happening in the joint leading to rheumatoid arthritis. So what does your gut have to do with your immune system attacking your joints? So first of all, rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disease, attacks the lining of your own joints. Why would it do that? And so there's a theory called molecular mimicry. What happens is your immune system thinks it's attacking something bad when it's really attacking your own body. And the gut microbiome is a key factor here. So I'm going to tuck, tuck, it's going to sound like a stretch, but just bear with me on this and hopefully I can not lose everyone. So gut dysbiosis and arthritis and as that relates to urinary tract infections and heart disease. So first, urinary tract infections. Came out in 2010, rheumatoid arthritis and a, a bacteria called Proteus. So a possible cause of rheumatoid arthritis is this UTI bacteria, Proteus mirabellus. So um, we know UTIs, a lot of times they originate from the fecal flora, the bugs crawl up the rectum into the bladder, the body develops antibodies, then attack the UTI, uh, the tract infection, and the hyaline cartilage that's in the joint. So in other words, Proteus, uh, your body develops an antibody to the Proteus, and then this the idea called molecular mimicry, which attacks your joints. So that's one theory. But then there's this other one that's, that's actually pretty cool, but hopefully I can not lose everyone. So this is a fantastic article. I love this one, this New England Journal of Medicine that was published back in 2013. And they looked at intestinal microbial metabolism of a substance called phosphatidylcholine in cardiovascular disease. So here's what they found. So when you feed, when we eat these phosphatidyl, phosphatidylcholine products that are found predominantly in animal products, so meat and, and eggs and dairy, then our gut flora produces a substance called trimethylamine. Trimethylamine is oxidized in the liver to form trimethylamine oxide, which has been found to lead to atherosclerosis, specifically stroke, heart attack, and death, our number one killer. So they, in their study, they looked at over 4,000 people over a three-year time frame. The higher your rates of trimethylamine oxide in your blood, the higher your risk of myocardial infarction, stroke, or death. So again, this is our number one killer. So trimethylamine oxide is bad, 
and it's, it's basically made by your gut bacteria. So they thought, well, this would be interesting. What would happen if we feed a steak to somebody who hadn't eaten animal products for over five years? Are they going to make, can their gut bacteria make trimethylamine oxide? So they did something called a carnitine challenge. So they gave a steak to an omnivore and then a steak to somebody who hadn't eaten meat for five years. And what did they find? This is right out of the article out of Nature. And they found that the omnivore, after a 24-hour time frame, increased their levels, the serum levels of trimethylamine oxide quite significantly whereas the vegan was not capable of producing trimethylamine oxide. In other words, their gut bacteria was changed to the point that they were not able to make trimethylamine oxide. So in other words, what they found, you feed animal products to an omnivore, they make trimethylamine oxide, which leads to increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, if you feed it to a vegan, they're actually not capable of producing trimethylamine oxide, which could lead to decreased risk, not eliminate it, but decrease. So that's great, but what does trimethylamine oxide have to do with arthritis? So let me explain. So in cells of 2020, they looked at circulating anti, uh, pro-inflammatory metabolites in its role of rheumatoid arthritis. So they talk about TMAO, and they found that TMAO is produced by a, a, a gut bacteria called Prevotella copri. And Prevotella copri has also been found uh, in large amounts of patients with new onset untreated rheumatoid arthritis. So the, on the left, NORA stands for New Onset Rheumatoid Arthritis. The orange color is the amount of Prevotella copri in that patient's gut. So you can see huge onset of Prevotella copri. And again, what's unique about that bacteria? That's the bacteria that produces trimethylamine oxide, among other bacteria, but that's the big one. So um, they also found that trimethylamine oxide was identified in the synovial tissue of the joints the synovial fluid, as well as in the serum. So, in other words, when you feed, when we eat on col uh, choline and carnitine, and your gut bacteria will then form trimethylamine oxide, which leads not only to heart disease, but also to joint pain. So, um, the, in Nutrients 2019, the microbiome metabolite, trimethylamine oxide, links vascular dysfunction and autoimmune disease rheumatoid arthritis. So that's how those two things are all are linked. So gut bacteria is critical for healthy joints. So how do you change your gut bacteria? You change your diet. So this came out in 2021. So this is in autoimmune diseases. And they said, quote, vegetarian diets can change the fecal bacteria population in rheumatoid arthritis patients, subsequently causing remission of clinical symptoms. So if you have any patients with autoimmune diseases, it's good to talk to them about a plant-based diet. These results suggest that dysbiosis of intestinal bacteria is related to the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. But when you talk to um, some patients that have it, it's not even talked about. Diet's not even mentioned with most patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So what's the key to good health, gut health and inflammation? It's really fiber. So I want to talk to you about fiber. So this is embarrassing to admit, but I graduated from medical school, and I did not know that fiber was only exclusively found in plants. I thought that there was some fiber in some fish, or maybe there was some fiber in some animal products or something, but it's only found in plants. So animals uh, have bones to, to withstand against gravity. Um, plants have fiber and it's fiber is the key, and let me explain why. This came out just this last year in JAMA, and they looked at dietary fiber and in chronic inflammation. Over 4,000 adults, and what they found is, is an increase of total fiber intake of five grams a day was associated with significantly lower concentrations of C-reactive protein and interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. Among the fiber sources, really cereal fiber was consistently the best for inflammation. So if fiber intake is correlated to overall decrease in cystic inflammation, how about arthritis pain? So can we make that leap to say it also helps with arthritis inflammation? The answer is yes. Um, this actually came out in 2017, and they looked at, uh, this is also part of that osteoarthritis initiative they talked about. So again, about 5,000 people, eight-year follow-up, and they, they, they classified their knee pain in four main areas, no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain. And what they found was dietary total fiber was inversely related to moderate or severe pain of the knee. So in other words, the higher your rates of fiber, the lower your risk of moderate and severe knee pain. And if you tell that to a knee pain patient, they're like, you're crazy. Like, I gotta eat fiber, is it gonna help my knee pain? Give me a steroid injection, doctor, or uh, I need my knee replaced. 
Fiber, this is what they're saying. Our findings suggest that high dietary to or total grain fiber, particularly a recommended intake of 25 grams per day, was associated with lower risks of belonging to moderate and severe knee pain development patterns over time. Probably nothing to do with x-rays. It's more to do with just how the knee feels. Now I gotta go over another really interesting thing. This is the inflammatory meat molecule, new 5 gc So this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015. And this is out of UC San Diego, and they looked at the red meat derived glycan that promotes inflammation and cancer progression. So this specific molecule, new 5 gc is highly and selectively enriched in red meat. Quote, the bound form of new 5 gc is bioavailable, undergoing metabolic incorporation to human tissue, despite being a foreign antigen. So it's a foreign antigen, your body incorporates it into the tissues, and then they said interactions of this antigen with circulating uh, antibodies could potentially incite inflammation. So that makes sense, right? So if a, an antigen is incorporating your tissues, what's your body going to do about it? It's going to make antibodies. And they're saying that that could lead to inflammation, systemic inflammation. And so in their article, they said new 5GC found predominantly in red meat is incorporated into human tissues. It leads to an antibody immune response and therefore systemic inflammation. So that was actually um, verified in another study in China where they looked at 306 samples, 102 different types of food for a total of 500 healthy freshmen from the local University of China. And they found that dietary new 5GC intake, specifically in red meat and dairy, is positively correlated with chronic inflammation, specifically those antibodies, CRP, and IL-6 levels. Now let's talk about arachidonic acid. So arachidonic acid, go back to our biochemistry, it's a mega-6 fatty acid, it's a phospholipid that's found in our cell membranes. And if you remember in the inflammatory cascade, it's these COX enzymes that convert arachidonic acid to the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. So do you remember how anti-inflammatories work, like ibuprofen, Celebrex, et cetera? Those work by blocking these COX enzymes, so arachidonic acid cannot be converted to these prostaglandins. So we t I tell patients that come in, we talk about inflammation, so you can either take ibuprofen and Celebrex with all their side effects, they're, they're not, they're not harm-free, or you can just not eat arachidonic acid. We have plenty of it in our tissues. We don't need to get it from our diet. So where does arachidonic acid come from? So the National Cancer Institute was also interested in this question because inflammation also leads to, leads to cancer uh, progression. So this is right out of their website. They looked at food sources of arachidonic acid. Number one on the list is chicken. So if people say chicken is anti-inflammatory, I would say, well, it is the number one source of arachidonic acid in the American diets. So I, I, I have a hard time believing chicken is anti-inflammatory. Number two is eggs. You say, well, eggs, that's a, that's a healthy food, right? Well, it is a big source of arachidonic acid. Then beef, hamburgers, hot dogs, ribs, fish, burgers, cold cuts, pork, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get to processed foods like desserts and stuff. So if we eliminate animal products, you're eliminating at least 85% of your, your food sources of arachidonic acid. So plant-based diet, in general, do all of these things. So they're the only sources of fiber. Again, I didn't know that until after med school. The only sources of fiber. They change your gut bacteria. They decrease your ability to make trimethylamine oxide. And we know that leads to not only heart disease, but, but, but joint pain. They eliminate the meat sources of the new 5GC molecule that I'm sure we're going to hear more about as the years progress, and arachidonic acid, which all lead to less inflammation. Furthermore, a plant-based diet is the source of anti-inflammatory phytonutrients. So when you look at all those colors of the rainbow that are in plant foods, those colors are these powerful phytonutrients that we call carotenoids. So carotenoids have extremely powerful anti-inflammatory properties. So you eat all the colors of the rainbow and you're giving your body a huge anti-inflammatory response with the fiber that's attached to it. Um, a systematic review of 46 studies demonstrated that meat-based diets are pro-inflammatory. Atkins diet, all this, it, I mean, the high-protein diets, low-fat diets are such a fad, they always will be, but unfortunately they're very pro-inflammatory. A plant-based diet results in, quote, reductions of almost all investigated inflammatory biomarkers. Don't forget to avoid processed foods. So we talk about plant-based diet is not 
processed foods. So refined carbohydrates, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, they're very, very pro-inflammatory. So those are not good. And this study came out um, just this last year, Frontiers in Immunology, excessive intake of sugar, it's a complex of inflammation. Quote, we emphasize that dietary sugars and mixed processed foods may be a key factor leading to the occurrence and aggravation of inflammation. I totally agree with that. This came out this year, so fresh off the press. Dietary intake and systemic inflammation. So we've been talking about inflammation all day, especially relates to joint pain, right? So they say, can we use food as medicine? And they found in the current nutrition reports, quote, data in human studies suggest that the consumption of plant-based nutrients is associated with a reduction in systemic inflammation. I agree, explanation point. While consumption of red meat and excessive dairy has the opposite effect. Then they said there is known association between diet and systemic inflammation. I think hopefully we've shown that. Thus, we recommend that clinicians discuss plant-based whole food diets with patients, particularly those that suffer from chronic inflammatory diseases and adjunct treatment for these conditions. I almost kind of wonder if they should change that to as a, as a main treatment for these conditions. So foods, and there's also foods that demonstrate to help with osteoarthritis symptoms, things like cabbage leaves, apple peels, sesame seeds, mushrooms, spices, specifically clove, ginger, rosemary, turmeric, everyone talks about turmeric. Um, these are all things that have been shown to improve inflammation, including biomarkers, TNF-alpha, IL-1-alpha, IL-6. So when you look at your plates, um, you hopefully you'll look at it and look at the rainbows of the, of, of the color. So this is uh, just something we had fairly recently on a bed of whole grains. We've got a bunch of vegetables and things, and this it's a teriyaki tofu with a bunch of other things. And this is a really great uh, meal, uh, filled with fiber, filled with phytonutrients, filled with anti-inflammatory properties. But unfortunately, we all eat as if we know we're going to die. So this is the actual picture of the last meal of Ted Bundy before he was executed on 35 counts of murder. So, so this has been studied, believe it or not, and this came out of Appetite in 2012, and they wanted to, they wanted to know, so they studied the final food requests of 247 individuals executed in the United States during a five-year time frame. What did they find? They found that they're eating the way we all want to eat. The average last meal is caloric rich, two and a half times the daily recommended servings of protein and fat. We're obsessed with protein, but we're everyone, no one's really protein deficiency. Kwashiorkar's disease, you have to be caloric deficient to be protein deficient. We don't see that as healthcare providers. But everyone's fiber deficient. 98 plus percent of people are fiber deficient. We're too focused on protein. We need to be focused on fiber. What's the most frequent request? It's meat, it's not surprising followed by fried food, desserts, and soft drinks. So when you look at your meal, and I hope you can tell us the patients, does your meal scream life or does it scream death? Do you have like a, a rotting piece of a dead animal on your plate? So, and I, and I also want you to look at it, is, is this plate, is this inflammatory or is this pro-inflammatory? And I think it's a good way to illustrate to patients, you know, to help with their, their joint pain. So in conclusion, there's many unknowns in elective orthopedic surgery. I hope I didn't come across too hard on my profession. There's a lot of great things, but there's a lot of things that make me a little uneasy that I've always felt that way. There's a huge role of lifestyle medicine for musculoskeletal pain. We don't really know why arthritis causes pain. We do think it has something to do with in the inflammatory response, specifically in the synovium within the joint. Arthritis is inflammation, rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. Inflammation arises from consuming animal products, processed foods, with resultant gut dysbiosis. A plant-based diet is the most anti-inflammatory diet due to its fiber and phytonutrient content. Thank you very much. So we have one minute. Any questions in one minute? Can you give us your, uh, your thoughts about the egg whites that you can buy plain without the, the yellow? Um, I can't say I know enough about egg whites. We know that, kind of I talked about one slide, the arachidonic acid is found in eggs. I'm not sure if that's the yolk or the uh, egg white. Does anyone know the answer to that? I actually don't know the answer to that. But I mean, in general, again, I think the main thing and message that we try to share with patients is just as much whole plant foods as you can. Because I think if you, if you, you set a line to say nothing at all, 
there's just no way. I mean, for us, it's hard enough, you know. I mean, how often do you go to a, a school or a, a church or community function, and the, the main thing is always going to be meat. And so it's, it's so hard to, to draw that line to say no animal products. So we usually just say as much whole plant foods as you can. So if you do some egg whites, I don't think it really matters. Besides, if you look at the, the blue zone studies, they found that the people that live the longest, the less health conditions, they're like 95% of their diet is plant-based. You're truly eating meat sparingly, like once or twice a month. And so I'll eat fish a couple times a year. That's kind of like what I try to do. We, we have a big fishing family. I grew up hunting. I did a lot of hunting growing up, elk and deer and, and, and fishing. So for me, it was a big change um, for sure. And I still join and, and participate with family events. We just uh, try to go plant-based. Nice, did you hear that? So he says, he says that, oh, do you say it a little louder? <laughs> okay. So the egg yolk is the fatty portion the, with the, you know, the nucleic acids and everything. And so that has the arachidonic acid in it. Um, the egg white is the protein portion. Um, so that, um, and they both have actually been shown, even patients with, who've just consumed egg whites, do have a slightly less deleterious response but it's still not as optimal as a whole food plant-based diet. Pa patients are certainly going to want to know when, after I go from my death to my life diet, will, uh, <laughs> will, uh, might I appreciate uh, a change in symptoms of pain? Would you, would we say, I'm sorry, you said would you knee, near knee pain improve? No, no, no. Uh, how soon after oh, how soon a after. dramatic change in diet is made might I see a change in symptoms of yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I think it's extremely variable. And it's hard because, as you can imagine, every, everyone here in this room who are physicians who try to talk about lifestyle medicine with patients, it's, it's challenging to get patients to actually make that change. I mean, and so, but I have found, I had one patient, he came in with carpal tunnel syndrome. He was a young, healthy guy. He was a, a cook at Deer Valley. And, um, and I just said, you know, you've got to just try this. Like, he was just hurting all over, but he came in mainly with numbness that he was, we were working him up for carpal tunnel syndrome. And I said, just, just try this. And his blood pressure improved, his weight dropped, his symptoms improved, everything improved. It took about a month. And you could even, he even showed me his blood pressure statistics that started to drop as he went on a whole food plant-based diet. So there's incredible things that happen. You're gonna hear more about that today. I guess Dr. Stoll is gonna talk and Dr. Katz. Um, they'll talk about some of that information as well. But um, I, I would expect you'll probably start feeling a little different in about a month. But the other thing, too, to remember is your gut, if it's not eaten this way, is not going to be used to all that fiber. I mean, I, it took me a while. So you're going to have a lot of gas issues, a lot of GI stuff. It's just not used to it. And remember, the whole microbiome is changing. When you're doing that, the whole microbiome is changing. So it's going to take a while to get used to that. So give it time, but it'll try to stick with it at least a month. You began uh, speaking about uh, synovitis. Um, does this also apply or has it benefit been seen with enthesopathy as the tissue that connects the tendon to the bone, such as Achilles tendonitis? That's a great question. Um, I don't think we know fully the answer to that one for sure, especially because some of those are related to trauma. And so, but I do think in general for healing of tendons, ligaments, bones, a plant-based diet is the best. I'm giving a little lecture later about bones and bone health. And if you look at the bone health world, it really is, I mean, whole plant-based foods are like the best. There was a great article that came out in New England Journal of Medicine because I know someone's thinking, well, what about dairy? Uh, New England Journal of Medicine, 2020, huge review on dairy and overall health. And there's no good evidence to support dairy for bone health. Um, they actually showed that there was no correlation with fracture risk with women in their dairy intake as teenagers compared to their fracture risk later on in life. And there was an increased risk of 9% fracture risk in men with the more dairy that they drank as teenagers. And, and so, but in general, dairy is not essential for bone health. And I think the same thing with, with things like tendons and, and ligaments and, and stuff. I, I think that, again, it's these these na Mother Nature's healing properties of whole plant foods. Yeah. You know, we talk about spinach and kale as being some of the best greens we can have. 
is fiber fiber, or is there better fiber than other fibers? Would we be eating different types of fiber? Yeah, so, so great question. Um, there are, and I'm sure that's going to be addressed a little bit later because we don't have time. But if you remember the one study out of JAMA that I shared, so, and that just came out just this last year, but they found that cereal fiber, at least for inflammation, because they looked at different types of fiber, and just in general, cereal fiber was the best for inflammation. So, um, but awesome. I think we probably have to wrap up, don't we? Thank you very much. Can I have one quick question? Because I know I'll be asked this. Okay, there's probiotics in a pill, and there is fiber in a pill. Do they have the same effect? Obviously not, but give yeah, me your so, take on that. So there's a, a great, a great book called Whole um, by T. Colin Campbell out of Cornell. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, please read that. But the key with that is that he argues that we're so reductionistic in our world of medicine, right? I, I am too. I do microsurgery. I do very specific things to a part of the body. Um, but he's arguing that when you eat the whole plant, there's incredible properties. He gives an example of an apple. So when you take the vitamin C out of an apple and take it by pill form versus eating the vitamin C in an apple, it has, it was like 250 times the potency in an apple compared to in pill form. In, in other words, there's things within these plant foods that, have, that we don't even know about, that have these incredible synergistic effects that help with all of these vitamins and nutrients and things. So we need to try to avoid being so reductionistic and just eat the whole plant. Thank you very much. <laughs>